Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started. I'm uh, Richard Edelman, and welcome to the 23rd version of the Edelman Trust Barometer. I have a very distinguished uh, panel today, uh, led by Thoral Barker, who's our moderator. He's editor of the uh, Wall Street Journal EMEA. The Right Honorable Helen Clark, who's former Prime Minister of New Zealand, former Administrator of UNDP. David Miliband, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee and a retired politician. Yoshiro Hori, who's founder and president of Globus University, founding partner of Globus Capital Partners. Hanukkah Faber, president of nutrition at Unilever. Jane Sun, CEO of Trip.com. And Lorenzo Simonelli, chair and CEO of Baker Hughes, an energy company. <clears throat> so this is our 23rd year. Um, we began this study after the battle in <coughs> Seattle in 1999, when the NGO stormed the WTO meeting protesting globalization. How innocent those days seem. <laughs> um, this year's study was conducted in 28 countries. In November of this last year, 32,000 people were surveyed. Three long-term trends that I want you to remember about trust. The first is, for the first 19 years we did this study, NGOs were the most trusted institution. In one year, 2020, at the height of the pandemic, it was government. In the last three years, it has been business. Second, Asia and the Middle East are the most trusting regions of the world. Developed democracies do poorly, but developed, developing countries do well, generally. Third, trust has moved from top-down to peer-to-peer to local. It's in my employer. Those are the three long-term trends of trust. Now, let me get to this year. 2022 was to be the return to normal. But the Russian invasion of Ukraine, inflation, interest rate hikes, climate shocks, the COVID lockdown in China, and then new fears of nuclear war and the cost of living crisis upset the apple cart. We've moved from Societal fears to personal fears. This is a major shift. We've unfortunately gone to a world of polarization. Six of the countries we survey, we've moved from division to entrenchment, where ideology has become identity. Those countries include my own. In the United States, let me give you some statistics. Republicans trust in government media in the low 20s. Democrats trust in the mid-60s. As to whether you're better off in five years, Republicans 23%, Democrats nearly 50. Consequence of polarization, only 20% of people are willing to work alongside someone whose views differ substantially from their own in the United States. Anybody who strongly disagrees with you therefore becomes the other. The key causes of this, low trust in government, systemic inequality, and a torn social fabric. Those are the similarities among the six countries that are in the polarized group. There are four forces that cause polarization. Force one is economic performance and expectations of economy. There's not a single developed economy that has over 35% belief that my family is going to be better off in five years. At the bottom of that list are Japan and France at 10%. As to economic performance, we see very clearly that there's very high trust in countries such as India, Indonesia, Saudi, UAE, because of economic performance. The lowest are Japan, Argentina, and South Africa. Again, poor economic performers. Force two, institutional imbalance. When you see a major delta between trust in government and trust in business, you have a big problem. What we see today is more than in half the countries we study, the gap between business and government is over 10 points. In some countries, South Africa, Mexico, it's bridging 40 points. Developing democracies, again, have a big issue. Business today is the only institution seen as both ethical and competent. There's been a substantial rise in business ethics over the last three years. 
If you think of a two by two, competence and ethics, business was in the lower quadrant on the right, has moved to the top quadrant. How's that happened? Because business is now seen as the motive force and having done a good job in the pandemic, focused on ESG issues, and lastly, over a thousand companies getting out of Russia in the face of the Ukraine invasion. Four times more than got out of South Africa over 20 years of apartheid. Force three, the mass class divide. We've been talking about this for a decade, but now this is a huge problem because of inflation. Inflation is hurting the lowest quartile of people. They feel it and they're said it to us. <coughs> It's now metastasized, the mass class divide. In three quarters of the countries we study, we have a 10 point or more gap. The high income people have rapidly ascending trust. The lowest income quartile <coughs> has flatline trust. The US gap is now 30, 23 points. China has gone from four to 19 points in the last two years. The mass class divide is no longer simply in the developed countries. It's now in developing markets. Force four the battle for truth. One of the worst legacies of the pandemic is the loss of belief in information and in experts. Experts were depositioned. It began this in the 2016 US election and also with Brexit. Media is now the least trusted institution in the world. A company newsletter is more trusted than mainstream media. Trust has moved to local, a colleague at work has the same trust level as an expert such as Dr. David Nabarro. That says a lot. Now, since business is the most trusted institution, there's a big demand on business to do more, not less. By six to one, people say, I want more business leadership on DE&I, on reskilling, on sustainability, 85% tell us, I want CEOs to take a public stand. As trust is in my employer, there's tremendous pressure on companies to speak to their employees and for their employees. <coughs> Two thirds of employees say, I only want to work for a company whose values are equivalent to my own. Realize, however, that there is a caveat. Over 50% of our respondents said, be careful on certain issues, business cannot avoid politics if it wades in. I have a very specific to-do list for business because the demands are endless. The need is now. Specifically, we need to come up with one measure for ESG. Business will be eaten by politicians if we have such a wide range of ESG measures. There were 180. It's ridiculous. We have to get to a single measure. It's a lot easier to defend if it's simple. Two, DE&I has to be a global, not an American or British program. It has to be pushed down to the SMBs through supply chain. Also, we need to look not just at gender and race, but at religion. Religion, important. Third, we have to hold divisive forces accountable. Pull your ad dollars from platforms that spread disinformation. Don't be afraid. And also show the science behind your innovation. Explain your clinical trials. Don't enable the other side to say these are made up statistics. Fourth, work with and not against government. By four to one in our study, people say we expect cooperation on privacy, on geopolitics. It's not a one-man game. It's a team game. Business has to lead in areas of comparative advantage. We have to restore economic optimism. When you realize that innovation, retraining, opportunity are the watchwords of hope, we have to get hope back into the system. Government has been badly damaged in the pandemic in terms of trust. We have to give government a chance to heal. This is smart business, not woke delusion. We have to help repair the societal fabric. We have to stand strong against political pressure. Do right and action drives trust.
Thank you very much. Thoral. Thank you, Richard, um, for that somewhat bleak um, picture. Um, um, we will attempt to address some of that. We're not going to get through all of it, obviously, but we'll have time for questions at the end, so the stuff we don't cover, uh, there'll be plenty of time for you to uh, chip in at the end. Um, Helen, I want to start with you. Okay, a lot of what Richard talked about, the, the roots of that appear to be in economics, in this lack of faith in the future, um, and also challenges of the present with the cost of living crisis, this gap between the bottom of society and top of society when it comes to trust. So what is your analysis of this in terms of you know, what can be done to, to narrow that from a policy perspective? I mean, obviously, inequality itself is a, is a, is a huge problem, but just give your, your reaction to that. Well, it's humbling to listen to these uh, findings as a former political leader because you know, trust is such a precious thing, and when it goes, it's not easily rebuilt. And I think the only way it can be rebuilt, really, is by politicians going back to meaning what they say and saying what they mean and not over-promising and delivering on what they do promise, because if you don't do that, you're, you're dead. Now, you know, the, the trends in inequality are, are bad, 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 and I think it, it will mean, uh, particularly in the developed societies like, like my own and others, really a, a commitment to uh, the basics. The universal health coverage, which the US still struggles with, but the rest of us still have. We have to give that meaning and make sure it's accessible to all. I think basic uh, universal social protection remains very important. You need a floor with dignity for the old, the jobless, the, the, the sick, the, the people with disabilities. It's got to be dignity. Education, you know, you shouldn't have to mortgage your entire family's future for that. I would go back in on the basics of what really matters. And then I thought Richard's last um, uh, insight into the importance of jobs, you know, that business, government working together on a job growth oriented economy, I think that will be really critical. David, do you want to just weigh in on this topic as well as a former politician? We, you know, the, both the issue of meaning what you say, but also you know, how business, which is what we're talking to in this room, can help. I mean, Helen knows what she's talking about. She won three elections, so I... <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, look, I think, it, in some ways, it's quite simple. A lot of politicians have got out of the solutions business. Yeah. I mean, the essence, essence of, quote-unquote, populism is that it's not an ideology, it's an attack, it's a cudgel, it's a, a baseball bat that you take to the system. And so since politicians have got out of the solutions business, uh, they've eventually lost trust. I mean, maybe a better way of putting it is a group of politicians have got out of the solutions business and another group have got into quack solutions. And both have drained trust. It strikes me that from your figures, business is in the solutions business and that explains part of its quote unquote success. I think that therefore the, um, the danger of Richard's analysis, which I think is very powerful, is that it neglects the role of agency that different actors have to play and that was implicit in what you said uh, at the end. You see, I think for NGOs, it's interesting, we're, NGOs are sort of two or three percent below the, the business. Too many NGOs in my, biz, in my view are in the suffering business, not in the solutions business. Yep. Because right. you can get a short-term cash donation mm -hmm. by advertising suffering, but actually, I mean, we, my organization is 3% of the global humanitarian budget. We're a one and a half billion dollar NGO. We are 35% of impact evaluations around the world because we're in the solutions business. And I think that's a really important sort of message that's underlying the survey that you've done this year. And it's just to follow up on that, is that, is the, 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 the idea of politicians getting out of the solutions business because the solutions are now very difficult well, or think, because they've just decided to go on a different tack? I think that's really interesting. I think there are two aspects to it. One is that the solutions of centre-left and centre-right in advanced industrialised democracies need to be rebooted. The centre-left built the welfare state, the centre-right went through its Thatcherite, Reaganite uh, phase. Mm -hmm. Neither of them have yet really transitioned to a new offer. I think the closest to it on my side of politics is the German coalition agreement, which is red, green, yellow. It's social democratic, it's um, liberal, and it's green, and it's trying to modernize the country in that way. You can see in America that the new House of Representatives with a, center, with a right of center majority has no governing agenda. It has an attack and an investigation bias of the administration. It doesn't have any positive ideas. So I think part one is that the, the, if you like, the center left and center right have to get back into, have to reboot their ideology. I think the second thing, 
And there's a brilliant book by this guy, Moises Naim, who talks about populism, polarization, and post-truth. They run into each other. And Brexit, Richard rightly uh, mentioned, it's easier to knock things down than it is to build them up. And I think that's been very, very tempting for short-term reward, and many countries are struggling with it. Um, so you're going to bring this back to the UK, your vision? <laughs> that's not what this is about. Sorry. Uh, yeah, just as an aside. Um, yes or no? <coughs> no. What? I don't, I'm, forget it. Uh, <laughs> Yoshito, um, can you talk a little bit about Japan? Okay, the, sure. The level of trust there is peculiarly low, yeah. uh, both for business and for government. Mm. What, is, what is happening there? Why is that so even worse than than many of the Western okay. countries. Richard and I did the session about a month ago in Japan and for two hours. And then I looked at the data and all of them, and they are lowest. Not only the lowest by far, the lowest and worst. But I found one figure which is the highest, but not only the highest, but you know, it's uh, by far the highest. Richard, do you know what data it is? It's interesting, page 13, and I've been looking. <laughs> <laughs> It shows that the trust from the abroad for the companies against the trust from domestic in Japan, the gap is the highest. I think I tell you, the trust from the abroad towards Japanese companies are third among nine. The highest is Canada, Germany, and Japan, and lowest is China. But trust from within Japan is the lowest among nine. But the gap between the, the trust from abroad and the trust from domestic, Japan is by far the highest. It's plus seven. The only country which trusts uh, abroad, uh, being trusted abroad is higher is Germany, it's only plus one. China is minus 58. So uh, China is being trusted uh, from domestically, but not from abroad. India is minus 55. And the US is minus 10. And what it suggests that Japanese people tend to you know, be humble, to evaluate Japan as, as high. And therefore we, you know, and uh, we are being so like uh, in Japanese words, we have such words you know, like uh, we have stupid wife or stupid sons when we introduce our sons and wives. We don't use that words any longer. But we've been educated to show that you know, Japan is low. Whenever we give some gifts, we always say this is a some small tiny gift. And even though it might be good, you know, that's the way it is. And therefore, the performance of Japan is not bad. So I'm very optimistic. By, <laughs> and by looking at the World Cup soccer, where we beat Germany and Spain. <laughs> and the attitude of Japanese you know, fans are so good. And therefore, I'm optimistic. The only reason why Japan is low because we tend to, low, we tend to be humble in evaluating, evaluating ourselves towards government and also the business and so forth. So I'm very optimistic. <coughs> so, so you think it's- trust Japan more. <laughs> so you think it's a purely cultural phenomenon? It's more cultural. You that you so I think it's good to compare between what is being trusted abroad and what is being trusted from domestically. And then I think that you can come up with some kind of figure to show that you know, what is actual trust from, domain, from domestic figures. But if you compare from Japan being trusted from, the, from domestically, we tend to put lower figures. But if you're being asked about abroad, do you trust Japanese people? I think lots of people will say yes. Do you trust Japanese government? Lots of people will say yes. Japanese companies, lots of people say yes. But domestically, we tend to be humble, we tend to be criticizing okay. towards our institutions. Jane, can you just give a, a perspective from China? Has some of the highest ratings in this survey uh, from, for business and for, <coughs> for government, um, uh, both your, your, your take on those numbers, but also um, how sort of recent uh, situation with lockdown and then the rolling back and obviously the, the deaths we're seeing from COVID, how much that affects this um, relationship with government? Sure. Um, I think in the past three years, it was very difficult for all uh, nations and for all government because there is national lockdown. Information was not floating uh, through uh, f smoothly and also visiting uh, with each other is not that easy. Uh, so that's why as a company, I think we should play a very important role. I traveled uh, more than hundreds of countries. Uh, I've never seen uh, evil people. Uh, there might be evil individual, but in the news highlights, uh, you always see uh, the worst of each country. And that destroys a lot of confidence uh, in each other. So as a company, uh, what we can do is with the unlock, uh, 
uh, of China of many countries. Uh, we should encourage uh, the people uh, from different countries uh, to go reach out to each other. So our mission is really, uh, while we are sending people further away, we are bringing the world closer. Uh, so as an individual, as a business leader, as a company, we ought to uh, do our best to rebuild the trust through our business. And, and are you concerned that as the, I mean, the economy obviously has slowed a lot in China, I think the, the lowest number apart from 2020 since the 70s uh, last year, um, is your feeling that you know, that trust can continue in a much slower growth world where actually that, that, that future prosperity is less obvious than, um, than it has been over the last mm. 20 years? Yeah, um, in 2022, it was the most difficult year, not only for China, but for the whole world. Uh, yet China delivered 3% GDP growth. Uh, in 2023, I look at all the GDP target by each province. Uh, it's somewhere between 4 to 9 percent. Uh, so we probably, on aggregate, can deliver 5 to 6 percent for 2023. Uh, so 2023 will be a very good year for China. Uh, Lorenzo, let's, let's just turn to business and the, the um, potential for business to impact that. Uh, Helen David talked a little bit about the political challenges and the need for solutions. Um, First of all, you know, if you look at the survey, business is the most trusted. Congratulations on that. Um, but it, it, there's also a sense of responsibility that business needs to get involved in a lot of areas beyond just running your business. Um, and as, they, as Richard mentioned, you know, the Disney example shows what can happen uh, in that situation. A lot of CEOs are pulling back from getting too involved because they've got a lot going on in their business. Can you just talk about business's role in this and, and how you see that? So I think um, it's very challenging, and if you speak to uh, CEOs around the world, to be a CEO. And the role that we play has considerably changed, and I think the report shows that, that people are requesting that we get more involved, we speak out, and as a CEO of an energy technology company, we've got to be selective, because you do want to make sure you don't get into politics. But I'll use the example of energy transition, which is a big topic and as you look at outside, people think that we can switch from hydrocarbons overnight and go to clean energy. And politicians will say, stop using oil and gas. And you look at the reality, which I don't think consumers fully understand, it takes decades to actually have an energy transition. And so I think business can come to the forefront by being very clear on the truths yep with certain subjects and being very clear and stating those. And when it comes to energy transition, I think we're getting to the conclusion where, number one, climate change is real and everybody's got to accept it. Number two, hydrocarbons are going to be used and it's not about the fuel source, it's about the emissions. And thirdly, if we don't start having more ecosystems created where the dialogue can happen, we're not going to solve these complicated issues. Businesses, CEOs are solutions based, so we have a role to play. But I also think we need to be careful that we don't overstep because there is a role for politicians, there is a role for the other stakeholders, and at the end, they actually have a bigger impact on societal issues and how society thinks. So we've all got to play our role, but it's definitely more complicated now. Can you just, just follow up on that relationship between business and, and politicians? And particularly, um, you know, in a world where people want very simple answers to questions, uh, typically in, in, in words that you don't take that long to read, um, and, and they tend to hear echo chambers of, of viewpoints, how do you get those complex arguments through and work with government to actually get an aligned perspective that you can follow through on that? So part of the challenge we have is, and I think you see it in a lot of democracies, politicians have a two-year view or a three-year view because of the way in which they get voted into power. And we've got to look at the longer term for some of these big topics and have the experts actually speak out and have a common view as to the conclusion we're trying to reach. And for us, it comes down to a lot of dialogue, a lot of explanation. But I can tell you, there are situations where I'll speak to politicians and they'll say, no, I understand the energy transition will take a long time. 
but I can't say that because I won't get the election votes. Mm. And we've got to get away from the populism of how do you win election votes to, at the end of the day, people want the best outcome. And you've seen what can happen when we've got constrained energy supply. Energy prices have skyrocketed. People are viewing that we're going into a recession. So by not taking the trilemma seriously of affordability, sustainability, and security, and being short-termism, we're then perpetuating these challenges. So it is something that we've got to address, and I think um, forums such as this help, um, but business alone can't do that. I'm going to come to you two in one second about this point of um, you know, a politician saying, yeah, I get that, but I can't say that, and just love your thoughts on that. But just, uh, Hanukkah, um, what's your perspective on this? You run a food and nutrition business. Trust is obviously pivotal in that. Can you just talk a little bit about your experience of that, and particularly when working with government and regulators, how you've, how you've navigated it? Yeah, I know food is, is so central to the general gloominess that um, Richard outlined. Um, Food's just gotten a lot more expensive in the last exactly. year, and we're a consumer business. Um, we have the privilege of visiting consumers around the world, and, and certainly in developing markets, when 75% of your family's budget is food, and that's up more than 50% this year, um, you are super concerned. But it's not only in the developing markets. I mean, just this morning, the Red Cross came out with a report from the Netherlands, one of the richest countries in the world, where now 30% of people say they are concerned about being able to feed their family. So the discontent is, is not a surprise. Now, to the points of everyone that were made here, we now have to act as business leaders and as politicians, because we can admire the problem for a long time, but we have to act. Um, we have to create a more resilient food system for people and for the planet, because by the way, food is also responsible for 30% of all emissions, actually more than energy. Um, so we have to create a system that's different. One of the foundational things that needs to change is a different way of farming and supporting our farmers to farm differently, farming in ways like our grandparents did, um, that emit less, that use less water, that create more biodiversity and that make soils healthier so they can actually store carbon. All these things are related. So that's what um, Unilever, myself, but many others in the room are trying to do here this week. We call it regenerative agriculture. How can we create more partnerships, and more are there funding? And consistent rules Absolutely. in terms of how you measure this and how you go about it across yeah. countries and across... Absolutely. I think there's a, an absolutely emerging um, consensus about this is about impact. So there's some practices that make up regenerative farming, but what's more important is the impact. So does it reduce emissions? Does it reduce water usage? Does it increase soil health? Um, and there's real good consensus emerging this week from that. Now we need the partnerships and the funding to make it happen at scale soon. Okay, thank you. David, can we go back to this point of um, telling difficult truths um, and sort of how you manage that situation that Lorenzo has talked about of we get that that problem exists but politically we can't say that. Just your, your observations having obviously been in a lot of these situations yourself. Well if you don't tell the difficult truths you're going to end up not being able to deliver and then trying to explain that. Right. So you're better to go up front with the difficult truths in my opinion. I'm very pleased the energy transition example has been raised because it's, it's so easy, isn't it, for us in the West to say, fantastic, we'll decarbonise, it's going to be electric vehicles, battery technology and the rest of it. Hey, <laughs> this transition can be a train wreck if we're not cognisant of the fact that we will have, as we try to go through it, an exponential demand for a range of strategic minerals, most of which are coming from some of the poorest and uh, least governance capacity countries in the world. And unless there's some uh, support for a process that scales up uh, minerals extraction, you're going to see corruption soar, you're going to see social conflict score. Uh, for my sins, I chair the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, and what we're seeing is that uh, with uh, mining exploration now, a lot of the interest is in the most sensitive uh, areas in the world for indigenous people, uh, the biosphere, conservation land, uh, et, et cetera. So the potential for this to go badly wrong is we export our problem, if you like. You know, we say, yes, yes, 
we're clean, but we're putting a lot of pressure on some of the least capacitated countries in the world to produce the goods that we want and produce it fast. And it, it, a gold rush always has a downside, and that's it. So you're saying we're hiding the problem rather than We're hiding the problem. It. We need to be frank about this, and if I were the EU, and you know, thank God for the EU leading, leading the charge on the importance of decarbonisation, but I hope it goes with a recognition that there's going to need to be a support for cleaning up governance and working through all these consequential issues. Otherwise, as I say, we've exported our problem. Okay. Do you, want to just, you talked about solutions-based politics. I mean, just, can you just uh, talk about this question of to, to go to solutions, you've got to acknowledge the problems and you've got to be clear with them. Just how that well, works I think in there practice. are two things I want to say. First of all, the challenge of telling the truth is not just to the electorate. There's also a challenge within political parties. Many politicians are most afraid, not of the people on the other side of the political spectrum beating them. They're worried about being primaried or challenged from within their own system. So there's a responsibility on parties about the way that they are put together. Secondly, I think that truth-telling is right, but there are two things that are essential if you're going to be able to make it, make it run. The first is you've got to run your own life in a way that is consistent with what you're the way you're saying everyone else should run their life, because hypocrisy is the ultimate sin in uh, politics. I think you get forgiven for being wrong. You don't get forgiven for doing one thing and saying another. And secondly, a word that hasn't really been used today, I don't think, is fairness. Mm -hmm. If people think the load is being unfairly distributed, they're going to be very, very annoyed about it, and mm -hmm. you can understand why. They're right to be annoyed about it. And we are living at a time when local and global inequalities are being magnified on a quite extraordinary scale. I mean, I, I work in the humanitarian sector, 340 million people, to pick up your point, Annika, 340 million people depend on humanitarian aid to feed themselves Jesus Christ. around the world. 1% um, of the world's population are refugees or internally displaced. So that's the most extreme end of inequality. There's effectively a famine going on in parts of East Africa at the moment. That's the ultimate, if you like, inequality. But I think that this sense of fair, if you haven't got fair, truth is, is, is one thing, but if it's not underpinned by fairness in the actions that are taken, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, win, you're not gonna win the argument. And can business, I mean, from a fairness perspective, um, business is very trusted at the moment. Um, how concerned are you about, you know, A, you know, you look at CEOs, you look at the, the level of trust at the moment, but, you know, pay is very high. There is, there is a big, big gap there. You know, we're probably going into a, a recession or, well, you can argue whether we are, but we've, we're seeing layoffs, we're seeing having to make tough decisions within business. I mean, Lorenzo, can, can that sort of uh, level of trust sort of continue or is this actually sort of a concern that you're being singled out as the, the people that can create the solution, but you actually, you can't do everything. Well, as I mentioned, I think um, CEOs, businesses play a role, but it needs to be a full ecosystem. And I think as you look at um, companies, we've got to play both local and global. And I can speak for my company and we have to be honest and we have to be fair, both on the global and local. And that means that there is consistency in the way in which we apply our policies, our sustainability, our diversity, and be very inclusive. And companies can do that because we can bridge across different nations. And that's unique. And I think the more we do that, the more then it can also be helpful as we go to country specific and also politicians. Because we do play a role in being in more countries, uh, being able to encourage uh, the communities and also have that sense of being global and local at the same time. Hanukkah, just on that, I mean, to what extent, I mean, you talked about the, um, and, and as is David, the problem of people affording food and um, getting food. Um, what is your role in that solution? I mean, as a massive producer of food, obviously it's about the quality and the nutrition, but also to, to what extent can you play a role in solving that challenge as well? And, and, Talk about that, please. Yeah. No, big food absolutely has a role and a responsibility to play in creating that, that fairer, first and foremost, but healthier, more sustainable food system. So as Unilever, we've made a number of pretty ambitious commitments to do that. 
Um, the first one is more plant-based eating. If there's one thing we can all do at an individual level, we don't have to become vegans, but if we eat a bit less meat and a bit more plants, that really helps on emissions. So we've put out a billion euro target. We've committed to doing more regenerative agriculture, which is absolutely critically important. We've committed to waste less. A third of the food in the world gets wasted. We could feed 10 billion people today if we weren't throwing it all away. So we're doing some really fun things with our brands, Hellman's, make taste, not waste. Um, that's what you gotta do. All those leftovers are better with a bit of mayonnaise. Um, <laughs> um, and um, then, of course, finally, more nutritious food, so working with people like David to fortify our products, products that people use every day like bouillons in Indonesia, in Africa, with micronutrients so children don't get stunted. So those are just some examples. Many of our frenemies, our competitors, are doing some of the same things, and it's going to take a village to change this. And do you see your role as, I mean, obviously you're selling your food, but do you, do you see your role as educating people about food as well. I mean, to what extent in this question of trust do you see yourselves having a role of actually yeah. explaining the realities around food? Yeah, I, people are smart around the world and I have yet to meet a mother in her home that says, you know, I really want to give my children unhealthy food. Um, that, that just doesn't happen, but it's our job to make it easy and affordable to help her do that. Okay. Um, we, I want to go to the audience in, in just a few minutes, but I just wanted to go back to this question of local um, very quickly and this, this fact that, uh, you know, trust is very local and that people are, are more concerned with their neighbours than with the bigger world. David, can you talk a little bit about um, the response to Ukraine uh, from around the world and just to what extent actually the world has come together, not from a political perspective, but from an um, individual perspective? Well, look, I think the truth is that Ukraine has united the West, but not united the rest. Um, <laughs> Europe has come out of the Ukraine crisis stronger, not weaker, God, he's um, both economically, militarily, security-wise, but also in the way it's treated the refugees. Uh, the transatlantic partnership has been strengthened. And I believe that Ukraine is a global crisis, not just a provincial European crisis. It's a global crisis for the rule of law, because of the impunity of an invasion. It's a global crisis because of the impact on geopolitics. And it's a global crisis because of the impact on food and energy prices. And so part of the Somalia story that I mentioned is a Ukraine story. Mm -hmm. But we've got to ex understand that for large parts of the world, leaders who are refusing to vote to condemn the Russian invasion in the, UN's, in the UN General Assembly, 50 countries more or less refuse to condemn it, they represent half of the world's population. Mm -hmm. and. They refuse to condemn it because they see double standards, because they, um, they've got ties to, to Russia, they don't, want to, they don't want to be forced to choose between one side or the other. So I think that Ukraine 2022 was the year of Ukraine. It is a global story, but we shouldn't be rose-tinted about the way it's seen. And frankly, if you're um, in Yemen or in Syria and you're displaced by fighting and you, you see the response of business and of governments to support Ukrainian refugees, you think, good on them, but what about us? Because the truth is, the UN appeal for Yemen is one-fifth funded. The UN appeal for Ukraine is more or less 100% funded. So uh, my argument would be, Ukraine has set a standard for some kinds of response to flagrant abuses of international law, but there are too many other examples where there isn't a response. And if I can just, sorry to um, extend this, but I think running through this conversation and running through the whole of Davos, I feel, is that people are recognizing globalization of risk, but they are focusing on the localization of resilience. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a mismatch there. Mm -hmm. You can't just meet global risks with local resilience. Yes, resilience has to be local, but it has to be global as well. Helen chaired the um, independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response, which I was privileged enough to, to serve <clears> on. <throat> COVID needed a local response, but local only has led us into the mess that we're in on pandemic right. response. And I think this, I feel there are tens of millions of people falling in this gap between global risks and local resilience. Because when you rely on local resilience alone, to state the obvious, it's those who can afford it who do it. <laughs> 
and there isn't much resi enough resilience in large parts of the world. Let's have a final word from you on this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think if in the West we're going to tell ourselves unpleasant truths, the reality is that a large gulf has opened up in trust. And uh, there is a, a, a narrative which, which has a, a justification clearly, which says, you know, where were you on delivering the climate finance you promised? You know, we're suffering that the money's never, never come through that you mm. pledged. Where were you during the pandemic? You hogged all the stuff for yourself, the vaccines, the therapeutics, the, the rest of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then along comes a war in Europe and you say, hey, everybody, you should put your hands up with us. Well, hang on a minute. That, that's been uh, the attitude. And I think perhaps we, we underestimated uh, the extent to which Russia still had pull in a lot of the world that it had uh, decolonization movements and that old sort of common turn and set of relationships yeah. uh, was, was, was able to, uh, to be activated. Uh, you also you know, follow the money and supply chains in other areas. Brazil, for example, I think it's about 80% of its fertilizer for, from Russia. So is it going to put up its hand up to, uh, to condemn? So it became you know, very complicated. And as David said, about countries representing about half the world's population didn't put their hands up mm. to condemn because there are a whole lot of other things going on, including this trust deficit mm. between North and South. And that, again, is cause for reflection. How do leaders in the, in the West try to, to bridge the, the trust deficit by, by delivering better solidarity. Uh, one of the <laughs> initiatives following on from the panel that I'm involved with is trying to think through this countermeasures issue, countermeasures being the diagnostics, therapeutics, uh, vaccines, heavens even oxygen, PPE supply, which the West hoarded. Now, how can we have a better system going forward so that there's much more equitable distribution according to need? Interesting. Um, we've got 15 minutes. Does anybody have a question? for the panel. Here at the front, please. Hi, uh, this is less a question and more of like, please react to what I'm about to say. Uh, my name is Paul Bennett. I fled the US after 30 years, about four years ago, um, and moved to Iceland. So I find myself in this sort of tiny country, far away from everywhere, where the biggest surprise has been that civility and civil discourse is one of the most highly prized national characteristics. To disagree and to be able to walk away from that is considered an act of strength, not an act of weakness. So you can go to an Icelandic dinner party, everybody could disagree wildly and all go home and nobody's had a fit. So imagine for a second living in a country where absolutely nobody trolls you. <laughs> Imagine that for a second. You can say something and then you can wake up the next morning and you're not all over Twitter. That's quite a revelation. So I'm very, very interested in this idea, and actually maybe it's to what you were saying, David. Um, how can we rebrand the centre and make centrism a place where we all agree to disagree in the middle? Cool and get the polarity and the hysteria from the edges to not be cool. David, do you want to take that? Mm. Well, if I, was, if I had an answer to that, I might be doing something different than what we did. And I think that running through this conversation is very interesting listening to Jane, you know, talking about China and the co that there are coalitions in undemocratic countries as well as democratic countries. And institutions <laughs> shape discourse and your plea for, for violent disagreement agreeably is I think very well put but I don't think it can be achieved just by being sort of happy clappy about it I think underneath what you were saying was there are disagreements but they are structured in a way that is productive rather than counterproductive and that comes down to money in politics it comes down to the relationship of business to politics and just a final thing to the extent that governments are retreating from big problems, I think the rest of us have to wade into them. That's where I think business and NGOs actually need to come together. Because if you think about big movements for change around the world, what do they need? They need government leadership, they need business innovation, and they need mass mobilization. But they don't necessarily need them in that order. There's something implicit underneath a lot of social change theory that governments come first. No, sometimes it's the business or NGO innovation, sometimes it's the mass mobilization that comes first, and then the politics gets dragged behind. My feeling is we're in a time when the structures of elected 
and on elected politics in some ways. Elected politics are not producing strong leadership on difficult problems. So that's where I would join with Richard's call for businesses and NGOs to be pushing the solutions and trying to drag the, drag the politics along. You, yeah, please, Annika. Yeah, no, just to build on that, I, I think focusing on what we need to do more so than maybe why we need to do it, maybe one way forward. So a, a great example, we were just talking about Texas. Um, you know, California talks a good game about clean energy, but Texas is actually by far the largest user of wind energy now. Obviously not because they believe so much in climate change or because they don't love oil and gas, but it's not the first time that Texas is doing the right thing for all the wrong reasons, and that's actually fine. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so that might be one way forward. Helen, do you, do you want to just weigh in, or, or, or Jane, or Harita, on this question of civility and this, this question of being able to, to disagree? Because obviously the, some of the findings in the survey were about, you know, if you don't agree with someone, you don't want to work with them, you don't want to engage with them. Can you, Harita, do you want to well, okay. talk about okay. yeah, I think your point is right, is that social media and internet have changed uh, the uh, capacity of leadership, what kind of skills are needed for, for leaders. Several years ago, WEF has formulated one agenda council called New Model of Leadership. I was involved with, uh, uh, with uh, Linda Grattan and also EQ you know, people, EQ uh, proponent. And then what we found out is that we used to be, leader used to need only like a smart, like cool head and warm heart. But now we need candid and timely communication. Therefore, um, we need to be, let's give an example, like Fukushima, the building has blasted. And one hour, the government has only one hour of time to say whatever they have to say. However, everybody is watching the scene of the blast of the Fukushima, and everybody is worried, and everybody is panicking. And therefore, the candid information and also smart and timely communication is needed. And that's what we feel is going to be needed. Therefore, the bottom line is that we need higher element. <laughs> for the <laughs> for the candid and smart communication, because communication is the key. The crisis of trust is crisis of leadership, and crisis of leadership comes from the crisis of communication, and that kind of communication is going to be needed. And then at the same time, the constituents are different. If you compare to Iceland and also U.S. and also Japan, so you need to have that kind of local communication. At the same time, you have to have the ability to be able to communicate globally. Like the example of Fukushima. Helen, will you just address quickly this issue of you know being able to disagree constructively and and, and walk away from that and, and move forward rather than just separate yourselves? Mm. Well, I, I think that sort of capacity to talk across what have been the traditional divides has definitely diminished. Diminished, and I think you know, probably social media has been a contributor yeah, sure, sure. to that because it's exaggerated the uh, the differences. I was pondering on on the Iceland example and wonder whether you know in in the heritage there, it, it's a small remote country. It had to hang together or. It, have hung separately as, as it were. It needed to be very resilient. Team Iceland. I mean, it, it, that came under strain with the financial crisis, of course. But, but basically, they've kept that civil culture. I think, to a large extent, in New Zealand, we've kept it. But you can feel it fraying. You can feel the the influences of the polarisation, for example, out of the US, which uh, you know plays in everybody's media, and and how that that's putting new new pressures on as well. So I think you know keeping that that ability to to talk across political lines to find the what what we have in common uh, what, what's our shared interest I think and, and I think that also applies geopolitically you know there's not necessarily a lot of shared values but we do have a lot of common interests yep. and we need to focus on how we address those let's take another question from the audience in the middle here Hi, um, my name is Alessa Camden. I'm 15 years old, and quite frankly, I have almost no trust in my future. Um, by 2050, I'm going to be 42 years old, and you hear all these absolutely uh, horrifying statistics about like what's going to happen. Um, there's a possibility of like a four, uh, four degrees Celsius increase uh, global temperature, and I'm kind of wondering like why is this not sort of number one priority on everyone's list? Because I mean. If you think about it, 
all of these other problems that you're discussing are super, super important, but if you don't have an Earth or a planet to solve all of these, like, um, what's the point? <laughs> so my question is just why is sort of the climate crisis not a priority? Because realistically, we've around six and a half years to limit global temperature change to 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Who wants to, to talk about that? Because I do think, and Richard, it may be something for next year to think about, is actually questions by generation and just mm -hmm. how people think um, and, and perceive this. Just, who wants to, to respond to that? And yes, it is a priority. You know, if we destroy the balance of Earth's ecosystems, we have no future as, as humanity. But I think the next step is to say it's not one swing of the wheel either. And as I said, you know, Sure, let, let's decarbonise, but let's also recognise that this is quite a, a tricky path to, to navigate, to get the supply of what we want to enable that to happen, to change people's eating uh, habits, as, as Unilever has been talking about. So a lot of things have to happen. So I suppose you know, my, my answer back also to younger generations who are pushing us hard on this, right? pushing us very hard, is be part of devising the solutions, because it's not just a slogan. We have to follow with concrete actions that are going to make the difference. I'll be an optimist in this one. And I think, uh, first of all, there is a clear understanding that uh, climate change is real and that we've got to address it. And I think collectively across the energy value chain, that's understood. Now it's actually implementing the solutions, but not thinking about 2050, really looking at 2030 and seeing how we can scale the technologies that are coming about with CCUS, with hydrogen, with clean integrated power solutions, because there is an understanding that we need a planet that is helpful for us to live in, and that it's gotta be beyond this generation, the next generation, the generation beyond. And I think at the end of the day, 1.5 degrees or two degrees, et cetera, we've just gotta focus on the emissions. COP28 has been called the COP for everyone. It's actually taking place in the United Arab Emirates. It's taking place in a country that has been based on hydrocarbons. But the focus there is how do we continue to effectively reduce emissions? And being an energy technology company, I can say that I have confidence that we've got the capability, we've got the will, but as we've said during this panel, it's now about action and also about stopping the black and white and actually having that center start to come out to the forefront because that's where the solutions can happen. And they've got to be pragmatic, they've got to be fair, they've got to be just, and it's got to be a discussion amongst all. Just, just, just let Hanukkah go and then finish with David, if that's okay. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing this up because it's obviously the critical question. I want to say three quick things. It is a huge priority. So at Unilever, we have a net zero target for 2039, 11 years before Paris, we got to get there. Second, and we've committed that, our shareholders have voted for that by 99%, like a North Korean vote, so that's one. Um, second thing, that's to really Helen's true. point, it is really hard to get there. Lots of things need to happen. And the third thing is I would say, try to be part of the solution because that gives hope. So my oldest is 22, my youngest is about your age. Um, he's just started a job uh, at General Motors building electric hummers, only in America. Um, but you know, being part of that energy transition, when you're part of the solution, it is much more hopeful than um, when you're just watching it from the outside. I think your question was, why isn't it a bigger priority? So I want to address that. I think that the climate crisis has suffered from being seen as separate from national security issues, separate from social equality issues. I increasingly see the climate crisis as an example of impunity. It's the abuse of power by the current and previous generations against the planet, which has no votes, and against the future, which has no votes at the moment. And I'm involved in a project called the Atlas of Impunity, which is going to be published next month. It's the world's first ranking of every country in the world on five dimensions of impunity, the abuse of power. Yes, conflict, governance, and human rights, but also economic exploitation and environmental degradation. And I really think we have a responsibility to try and join up the climate crisis to these other, um, to these other crises. And to Lorenzo's point, actually, 
what's happened as a result of Ukraine is to drive a decarbonization agenda in Europe for national security reasons rather than for climate crisis reasons. But that's fine because it's driving the decarbonization in a very strong way. And I think the climate crisis would benefit from being part of the rest of the conversation rather than separate from it. Final word, we have, um, unless Jane, do you want to okay. say anything? Uh, we... okay, it is a high priority, but we have to talk about solution. I think there are only two solutions. One is to use renewable energy more, and the other one is using nuclear energy. And we have to be you know, very candid in terms of communication to state to the government that we have to utilize nuclear energy for the purposes of cutting down carbon dioxide. But not many people say that. But I think we have to be always be uh, candid and at the same time we have to be bold enough uh, to be able to say whatever has to be said for the sake of the planet. Mm. Great. Well, thank you all to our panel and thank you for coming.